All right, folks. It seems like we have a quorum of people in the room. I know there's a lot of misnamed people, but as long as everyone stays on mute, we'll be in good situations. So uh, before we get started, I just want to make sure everyone's aware of a few things. We are coming virtually for the third month in a row. Uh, the idea of this talk is supposed to be a smackdown between Noam's, one of the most viewed videos we've ever had of Noam talking about GAMS. And now Gavin's coming here to trounce Noam is the goal here. So we'll see if that happens. No pressure, Gavin, to, yeah. to uh, knock this out of the park. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Notice uh, Noam is staying muted for yep. this. <laughs> Uh, so everyone, part, part of the beautiful thing about, um, part, part of the thing about this uh, pandemic, while we're not able to meet in person, we are able to get speakers from other parts of the world, which is nice. We have uh, Gavin coming to us from somewhere very west and north of here. Uh, we Last month, we had someone from California. The month before, someone from New York, but you know, we have New York people too. So we're going to do our best to keep people coming in from all over. To help facilitate this being a little different than normal, uh, we have a Slack team. If you go to nyhackr.org and then click on the Slack link, and if you're doing it for mobile, you might need to scroll through the menu a little bit, but it's nyhackr.org slash slack.html. In fact, we could post that link in the chat. There is a Slack team all devoted to the meetup. In there, we have you know, channels so you could talk about um, this particular meetup. There's an R help, there's Python help, Git help, there's events in general, there's job postings. So a lot of you who are regulars at the meetup and you come to the physical meetups, you know that I like to start the meetup by saying, who's hiring? Well, we uh, can't do that here uh, because there's no way we could all facilitate this of 100 some people virtually. So if you have a job and you're looking to hire someone, please go into the Slack team to the job postings channel and post your job on there. I just saw a volunteer opportunity posted today, a job posted a few days ago. Uh, please go post it in there. I know lots of people have gotten employment th from the meetup. So I hope that we can still get employment through this virtual meetup. I know that someone just very recently posted a job. Let me go check out what job it was. I'll shout it out. Uh, let's see. LambdaLiterary.org posted a job. That was Kevin Troy. Before that, Georgette Asherman, a long-term member, she posted a, uh, looks like a contract job, but Georgette posted one. Before that, Medidata posted a job. Uh, let's see, uh, some people are looking for full-time employment. Doctors Without Borders posted a job. The US Military Academy posted a job. The Health Recovery Solutions. Uh, so you see there's lots of jobs there. So if you have a job you're, you're looking to hire, post it in here. If you're looking for a job to get hired, go in there and see what you can do about finding a job. So that's the first thing. I hear someone, uh, so yeah, try to keep the questions to Slack, make it a little easier. Also for my regulars, you all know we like to start with pizza. We always have pizza at the beginning of the meetup. Well, keeping the tradition alive, today I got Ribalta. So you can see here, it's a Neapolitan style. It's a wood burning oven. You could tell from the back of it. Has good cheese lock, but it also came delivery, so it takes a while. Uh, so it's a, little, it's a little cold, but it's going to be very good. It's, I firmly believe this is one of the best pizza places in the world. I, I will say that firmly. I, I'm going to go that bold. In fact, when I was in Naples, someone told me, this guy owned a pizza shop told me, his friend owns the number one pizza shop in New York, and, and he said Ribalta. I'm like, I agree with you. So as we all know, we like to keep this very social. It's hard to ask questions here. So if you can... Ask your questions in Slack. We have a channel called, I believe uh, it's called Meetup now. Uh, May f I don't think we have the channel. If you go into the events channel and I, 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 if you go into the events channel and ask your questions in there, I will collate all of them and I will ask Gavin afterwards. At the end of the meetup, I'll ask everyone's questions for them. Um, so please go ahead and look for that. Someone did actually ask in the group chat here, what's the workspace name on Slack? It's NYHackR, just like our group name. And I will go post that link in the, in the Zoom chat right now. If everyone gives me a second. So in the Zoom chat, I am posting the link. It's nyhackr.org slash slack.html. And you'll see this giant photo of JD Long taking a selfie at the conference. 
Above him, there is a link to join Slack. Uh, go on there to uh, join the conversation. Okay. And Amada? Sorry, there's the real, a June. The real Amada? <laughs> there's a June 22 um, meetup channel now within NYHACR. Great. So if everyone can actually ask the questions in the June 22 meetup channel, please go in there and ask the questions so it's easy for me to find. Uh, many of you know we like being very social here, as I've mentioned a few times. Since we can't be in person, if we all go back to gather, in the bottom, toward the bottom of the room, there is a virtual bar. Now, whether you have an alcoholic beverage or a non-alcoholic beverage or whatever you want, if you go to that bar area after the, the talk, we'll be hanging out down there just to chat and hang out. I myself will have like a, a bottle of beer down there, but feel free to have a bottle of soda, a bottle of water, or actually no bottles, use tap because it's better. So feel free to go do that to the bar afterwards. Um, I've already showed you the website, NYHackR. I think it's a, uh, we put a lot of work on that. It's built with R. So there's, if you go to nyhackr.org, there are 10 years worth of presentations, maybe even 11 years worth now, and about five or six years worth of videos. So there's a lot of information you can get there. Um, lastly, well, two more lastlies. Next month, we don't have planned yet, but it will almost certainly be virtual. It is likely going to be talk about Linux, actually, believe it or not. Then in August, as part of our week, it will be Drake. Uh, we're still working on the details on that. Actually, I'm not certain, but it should be Miles McBain talking about Drake. And speaking of our week, August tw 12th through 15th, next in August, will be the virtual New York R Conference. Uh, we held this thing in person for five years. This will be our first year virtual. Uh, I know out of people here, Noam is, I think Noam's scheduled to speak. I don't want to promise that. I think he is, but I'm not sure. Uh, we have David Robinson. We have Andrew Gellman. We have the, the both Nolases. We have Emily Robinson. We have Brooke. Oh, man, I've just had a blank in her name. Sorry, Brooke, if you're there. We have Watson. Dan. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. We have Dan Chen. We have a whole Max Kuhn. We have a whole great crew of people speaking. Uh, if you want to hear more about that, you go to rstats.ai. I'll put that in the, in the chat, rstats.ai. Um, that's how you find more about the conference. We try to make it as cheap as possible since it's going virtual, We're trying to you know, make it just cover costs. Uh, and, but if you want it to be even cheaper, the code NYHACKR gets you 20% off. All members of this meetup are eligible. Anything we do, basically, the code NYHACKR gets you a 20% discount. So go to rstats.ai to see more about the conference. With all of that, I think I've gone through all of my notes. We got a bit of a late start because we had a hitch with the, uh, the Gather platform. Um, we are going to get started. So remember, folks, please try to hang out at the bar afterwards. Remember about the conference. Remember about next month. Remember about jobs. And remember that this talk is now a challenge for Gavin to be the best GAM speaker we've ever had. So coming all the way from Saskatchewan. Is that what, that's it, right? Saskatchewan? That's right, yeah. Come all the way from Saskatchewan, please welcome Gavin to the stage. Thank you very much. And thank you, Jared, for inviting me. Thank you, Noam, for suggesting me and uh, linking me with Jared. Just want to check, can everybody hear me okay? Cool. Thank you. Right. I'll get on and slide. Share my slides. <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> hopefully everybody can see that. So um, yeah, my name's Gavin, Gavin Simpson. I, um, I am, I'm not Canadian. I moved to um, Saskatchewan, to Regina in Saskatchewan um, about six, seven years ago now. Um, I'm an ecologist and a paleoecologist that's just happened to get into um, doing statistics um, over the last um, sort of, since I finished my PhD really. Um, <clears throat> What I'm going to talk about today is um, how is, is what I do with GAMS, and, and that's sort of learning when things have changed in the environment, where they've changed, and by how much have they changed. And I'm interested in, in things that ch how ecosystems change in time and in space. And um, as we'll see, some, there are some reasons why I've ended up using, using GAMS to look at these kinds of data that, that I come across. And I'm going to go through some of the kinds of data that I work with. On a, on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> sure. So um, 
just very generally, I mean, we're, we're doing statistics to try and learn from data in the presence of noise. We have these noisy, complex data sets and we want to learn something from those things. So we're going to learn from data and we do that using usually using models. And we might estimate parameters from some theoretical model that we might uh, have. So in, in my uh, field, we might have a, um, a population model like a Locke Volterra model or something like that where we're um, interested in estimating parameters for some population to see whether the, the population might crash and die or whether it's going to explode. Um, we might have some theory and we want to compare that with some observations. So we might want to estimate some parameters from a model, compare those with the theoretical expectations. Um, and then often we want to make progress where there's very little or no pro uh, theory and we might just want to estimate things from our data. And that's often because data um, is, is really good. It tells us things about the world and we want to learn from that, even if we don't have a very good handle on what the, what's actually happening in, in the world. So when we're learning from data, it could be something as simple as just fitting a linear regression like this, or it could be some fancy uh, deep neural network um, that's trained on massive data sets. And um, you know, we, we, could make, we might like prefer this, depending on your sensibilities, or you might prefer this kind of thing. Um, but learning involves trade-off. We can have some <clears throat> models that have potentially low bias, or we can have models that have low variance. So we have models that fit the data really well, have low bias, but they might have high variance. Um, or we can have models that perhaps are simpler, and therefore they have lower variance, but they might not fit the data as well. And that essentially reflects this, this continuum from the deep learning model and to the regression model, the simple linear regression. Um, and there's another trade-off here. Often, if we have models, as simple models, like the linear regression, it might not fit the data very well, but it's really interpretable. I can summarize that linear coefficient, uh, that linear line in a single number, and that tells me how much y changes uh, as I change x. But for something like um, <clears throat> some very, some deep um, learning model, it, it might be, um, I know people are working on are making these things better, but often they can seem like a black box. So they might fit the data really well, but it's, it's much harder to understand what that model is, is doing and how it's encoding information. And so we do have these trade-offs when we're learning, learning from data. <clears throat> so here's a slide I've stolen from uh, Noam's GAM course. And GAMs kind of sit in the middle. If you're gonna think of linear models uh, on the one hand, um, of being the sort of simple end of the model spectrum, and then some black box sort of machine learning um, tools at the other end, um, then GAMs kind of fit in the middle. They're, uh, they're, they're very interpretable, um, generally, as long as we don't start fitting very high order um, functions, um, and the, the methods actually try and stop us from doing that to some extent. Um, but, so we, we, but we can fit things that are um, much more complicated than linear models. So we can do better at fitting the data, but we also get out some um, easily visual, visualizable functions that mean it's easier to understand what the model is encoding, how it's encoding information. So GAMs work by fitting wiggly functions, <clears throat> um, wiggly things. And this is kind of what GAMs are doing. Here I'm showing a, um, for some covariates, some predictive variable x, I'm just showing ranges of different functions. And these are, I'll explain in a minute how these things are, are created. Um, but this is just a spline. And it's just showing a whole potential range of models that might um, show how the effect on our response, our function f of x, how, that, how the response changes as some smooth function of our covariates. And so we're gonna try and use these kind of wiggly things, these kind of smooth um, terms, these splines in our models, rather than just assuming that everything is strictly linear or linear in parameters that we can estimate from some linear model. So let's have a look at what GAMs are and, and how, we, how we fit them. <clears throat> so contrary to um, Jared's protestations, GAMs are not magical. And for the next few minutes, I want to try and explain how GAMs fit data? How do they learn from data? And there's a lot of um, these GAMs when they were first invented, um, they, you had to plug in a lot of things. You had to tell it what, the, um, uh, what kind of degrees of freedom you would like for your, your model. So you had to choose your complexity up front. Well, I'm not talking about that kind of GAM today. I'm talking about ga um, GAMs that we can fit using MGCV and other software tools where you don't have to specify how many degrees of freedom you want to, to fit your model with. 
you can just let the model itself to uh, choose how wiggly these functions should be. But they're still not magical, and I'm going to explain how they work. And they work basically through something called a basis expansion. And so here's an example. And this is one of the examples that got me interested in um, using GAMS for, um, for, for modeling time series data. So um, at, at the time, and I'm showing the, here the Hadley Center data from the Met Office in the UK. And this is just the, um, this, what I'm showing actually is the median value of the, a large number of ensemble runs where they have some big model um, that pulls together all of the temperature information that they've collected from all over the world and then turns it into, this is the median uh, estimate of the global temperature, um, um, or annual temperature from about 1850 to, in this case, I can't exactly remember when I got it to, but to some, some uh, date up here. I think this is up to date, so it's like 20, um, 2016, I think. Anyway, this, this is the latest run that I was looking at. And what we might want to do here is we might want to estimate, well, okay, there's a lots of wiggling on um, going on in here, but we might want to uh, um, fit the sort of average change in temperature. And we might not want to just fit a straight line through these because that, that suggests that temperatures will have been changing at the same rate everywhere. And clearly from this graph, they haven't been. And when I started looking at some of these things, I was looking at the literature um, on how people have approached this. And the classical way that people would approach fitting some sort of smooth model to this would be to use a filter or some moving average. But of course, when you do that, because of the, you're using some width of window, you end up not being able to fit the most recent values because you haven't observed the values that are inside the window that, that extend into the future. And so there was a lot of um, uh, papers being published by Michael Mann and, and, and lots of other people about how best to, to pad the data, to essentially make up new data that we haven't observed yet so that they gave you an unbiased estimate of what the, the trend was at the end of this time series. And of course, I'd started to come across GAMS and I thought, well, GAMS would be a much better way of trying to do this because you don't have to sort of, you don't have this argument now about how to pad the data. Do you pad it by just extending the last data point? Do you pad it by extending the sort of mean of the time series? So there was a lot of work going on how to, how to do that padding, basically making up data. And I thought GAMS could do that better. And I'm going to illustrate how GAMS work um, using this particular time series. So one basis expansion that we could use would be just to sort of fit polynomials. So we could fit year plus year squared plus year cubed and so on. But this gets really difficult, partly because we, we have to then choose what degree of polynomial we might want to fit. And, uh, and that's not necessarily that easy to do. Um, and also, um, you can see the problem that we're getting. Once we start to get into this sort of light, to these two purple curves here, they seem to be doing a pretty good job of fitting the data in this, um, in this time series. But they do very poorly. They start to do weird things at the ends of the time series. So they start shooting off in, and doing weird things. And this is a well-known problem with these kinds of polynomial models. But the polynomial um, that I just talked about, having x and then x squared and x cubed, that is a basis expansion. And it's actually quite similar to how um, GAMS use. They just don't use that basis expansion that was giving us all those problems. So the basis expansions that GAMS use, uh, splines. Uh, I showed you an example of a spline a few minutes ago. And splines, they're formed from these little basis functions. <laughs> so if we, this is our range of our covariate x, just between 0 and 1. And I'm just showing one kind of spline here. This is uh, called a cubic spline. So it's, a, it's kind of made up of little chunks. So the spline is going to be made up of little chunks of um, cubic polynomials that are made to join up at what are known as these knots, these locations here, certain knots. Right? So we have some knots, some places that we want to have these piecewise cubic functions spread over. And um, how we create the spline is by creating what I'm showing on this screen here at the moment, which are these little basis functions. So each one of these is a, is a cubic basis function. It's, um, it has some positive value, its highest positive value at its knot. So there's a knot here, there's a knot here, and so on, okay? Um, and um, then they, these, these, this particular basis has this other property that there's zero at every other knot. So you can see this particular basis function sort of wiggling around, but it's zero at every other knot, right? 
So we've changed from having x or x plus x squared plus x cubed and so on. We take x and we turn it into these little basis functions. So here I might be turning it into 10 basis functions. So instead of just having x in my model, I have 10, um, 10 little basis functions that represent the effect of x. And then what I want to do is just choose some different weights. So th the figure that I showed you earlier with the, the black line, the wiggly black line, it was being generated just by choosing some different weights for each of those basis functions. So each one of those lines has a different weight for the sets of basis functions, and that gives us these different splines. And our job now is to find some uh, weights or model coefficients that allow us to have a spline that fits the data really well. <clears throat> so how, what spline, what coefficients do we, can we get to fit the data? Okay. So here's a, another quick example. This is just some classic training data that we use in, um, <clears throat> For, for GAMS to illustrate how splines work. I've just sampled some data. The true uh, function is shown in the golden color on here. And then the data that I've sampled from it are shown in the gray dots. <clears throat> and now what we're gonna do is gonna do the same thing. <clears throat> so I'm gonna put little basis functions in here, 10 of them. And then I'm gonna choose some um, weights that will make the spitted spline go as close to the data as we possibly can with 10 basis functions. So this, is, this animation is just gonna repeat in a second. This is just showing how the spline fits the data. So we choose different weights. Those weights for these coefficients allow the spline to fit the data best. So our model fitting, uh, when we're fitting our model, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the best values for some coefficients so that, that makes our spline go as close to the data as possible. And we do that, we find our coefficients by maximizing a penalized log likelihood function in general. Okay. But this is all the splines are doing. So really our problem comes down to just trying to find weights for each of those basis functions. And it's exactly the same as, almost exactly the same as the polynomial model that I showed you earlier, where we were, you, we were finding the coefficients in the linear model to make the polynomial um, fit the data best. Now we're just doing it, to, but we're just using a different kind of basis expansion to make it fit the data well. But we don't want to overfit the data. So we need to try and avoid overfitting. We could use as many basis functions as we had observations here, and then we would fit the data perfectly, but we'd just be interpolating everything and we'd have a horribly wiggly function. So we need something to stop us overfitting. And we, to, the thing that stops us overfitting is something called a wiggliness penalty. We don't want to fit too complex a model or too wiggly a model. So um, we have a penalty, the penalty, and I'll tell you exactly how the penalty is measured in a second, but we just have something that controls how much, um, how much of a penalty we actually pay for the complexity. So when we have a very strong penalty, then we're essentially fitting a straight line through. So the plot on the top left here is showing what we'd have if we have a very strong penalty. Um, and we're penalizing very strongly against wiggliness. And so we just go back to a straight line, okay? We can't do any better than a straight line. We can't penalize back to a flat function. And I might um, talk about that, or it might come up in questions later why we can't do that. But that's the bet sort of worst we can do. And then as we start to relax the penalty, we start to see more and more curvature. Our, our spline gets a bit more wiggly and we start to fit the data better. But if we were to overfit, if we were to choose a penalty that was too small, then we had all of all these sort of little wiggles that we see here in this fitted model. They're just overfitting the data. They're just fitting the noise rather than the signal. And then this one here is pretty close to the optimal actually for, for these particular data. But here we just see that we've got um, some, but some, we're paying some penalty. We're not paying as much penalty as, this, as the top left here, but we're not allowing it to be too wiggly. And so our model fitting really comes down to finding some balance between this at one extreme and then something that's really wiggly at the other. Right? So that lambda is called the smoothness parameter and that's the thing that gets optimized in, in the model whilst we're choosing our coefficients or estimating our coefficients, our weights for our basis functions, the lambda is the, the thing that's controlling how much of a penalty we pay. So how do we measure the wiggliness though of these curves so that we can work out how much the penalty is costing us. Okay, well, I said I was gonna try and avoid some math and do it in pictures, but I'm gonna do a little bit of math. Um, what I'm showing you here is this is a measure, this is wiggliness and shown two different ways. 
And um, the, this is just saying we're going to integrate over the second derivative of our curve. So we're actually set paying a penalty for the curvature of the, the fitted spline. That's what the penalty is. That's our measure of wiggliness. Now you can have different ones in here. The default in MGCV and the default one in, um, in most other GAM-like software is to do a penalty on the second derivative, on the curvature. So that just avoids having um, splines that fit, um, that, that change direction too quickly. That's what it's measuring. It's measuring the curvature. And so you pay a really strong penalty if the spline is, going, is wiggling backwards and forwards too much. Okay. <clears throat> so that penalty, that this bit here, this, I'm writing it now in a slightly different format um, here, but that's what goes into the model. This is the, the penalty and it's measured in terms of the model coefficients, which is really useful when we're fitting because we don't have to do any of this stuff. Okay, so we have a penalty matrix, which is S. So that it kind of encodes the wiggliness of everything. Um, and then the, these vectors of coefficients. And together, that is a measure of the wiggliness. Okay. So once we've set up our penalty matrix, which is really easy to do, instead of those basis functions, we can set up the, this, this sort of penalty matrix S. Then all we need to do is estimate the coefficients. And then that tells us how wiggly our function is. And then we can pay the penalty for that. So then this is what we're actually fitting. So in L, this is our log likelihood of our parameters. And then we just pay some penalty. And this is lambda. This is our smoothness parameter in here. That's just telling us how much penalty we're going to pay for the wiggliness of our given curve. Right? So now we're going to choose betas and our smoothness parameter that allow us to fit the data um, best without overfitting because then we'd be paying, if we were overfitting, we're gonna be having too wiggly a function and therefore we um, will be paying a price for that wiggliness, that complexity. And therefore our penalized likelihood, uh, log likelihood is likely to be lower and therefore indicating a, a lower fit. So if we do that in MGCV, and I showed something that was similar to this earlier, but this is the optimal fit to those temperature data. And we can do that by just um, modeling our data straight away. We don't have to um, pad the data at the ends. You'll notice that the confidence interval on here is getting a bit wider at the ends, and that's reflecting the uncertainty that, that we have because there's nothing to constrain the spline really beyond the data. Right? So our uncertainty about where that spline should go is, is also reflected in our model. We don't have to do any padding. We get a nice fit. And also, I mean, this data set here is regularly spaced in time, um, but we don't have to have data that are regularly spaced in time. We could have gaps in these time series and the GAM would still work for that sort of data. So GAMs are really quite useful for sort of fitting data, but this is a really simple example. And I wanted to get on to explain a little bit more about how we're using GAMs sort of the, and the, the real uh, advanced sort of tools that MGCV provides us. So let's just see how we do that fitting before we go on to do something more complicated. This is enough to get you essentially the fit that I showed on uh, the model. This looks very similar to a, a GLM if you've ever used the GLM function in, um, in R. Um, we just change a letter. So now we have an A, GAM, instead of a GLM. And we change one other thing in our, um, in our formula. Rather than just using the name of the covariate as you would for linear terms in a, in a model, we have to wrap it in this function S. And when you do that, then you, by default, you get a particular kind of spline. It's called a thin plate spline, but you can do cubic splines uh, and things, which is the, the examples that I showed earlier. Um, but this will give you a spline with 10 basis functions. And then there's only one other thing that you have to do, and that's you have to choose um, to fit using method equals REML. And this sort of sets the model up in a particular way and gives you the best um, behaving smoothness selection. Right? Um, it's not the default, unfortunately, and that's why the, the name MGCV, that's where that comes from. Um, the GCV, it used to use a thing called generalized cross-validation, and that's the default. Um, but that can undersmooth, and um, we don't want to, uh, we, it has a tendency to undersmooth, and we'd rather not have that happen. So uh, fitting using REML or ML is, is something that you should definitely be doing. But this would set up that model that I just showed on the, other, on the page there. So it's really quite simple changes. And then if you wanted to, you could use the family argument. If you're familiar with GLM, you could use the family argument to fit like a Poisson um, model for count data or um, gamma models for continuous positive reals and so on. Right? 
So it works very much just like the GLM function, except we have to tell it that we want smooths in our formulas and that we also have to tell it we want to do smoothness selection using Remel. But that's all that the change. And these objects that um, GAM um, produces <coughs> are actually very, very similar to the GLM objects. They, they work similarly and they actually use some of the GLM methods that come with R to fit them. Uh, sorry, not to fit them, to, to, um, for plotting them and looking at the residuals and things like that. Okay, <clears throat> so I wanted to show sort of a more of a complicated example now that illustrates some of the more advanced features um, in MGCV and the sorts of more complicated models that we can fit. We're not just limited to fitting single time series. So this is some of the work that I do sort of on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'm, a, I'm an ecologist, but I'm an aquatic ecologist, I guess. Um, and I'm interested in how lake ecosystems change through time. Um, and a lot of my work was done using the recent past, the last few hundred years, um, which we often looked at using lake sediment records, so the mud at the bottom of the lakes. Um, but to understand how those lakes were changing over the past couple of hundred years, we also want to know how the lakes are changing today. And so I um, do a lot of work on limnology and, and things that, change, uh, that are going on in lakes, the contemporary lake ecosystems today. And so this is um, an example of a, an example that I've been working up to illustrate how useful GAMs are in, in non-standard settings. And the, the problem that we're looking at is um, we've got a lot of data now um, that records how, what the lake temperatures are. And people have been interested in collecting temperature data from lakes for a long time. People use their lakes for swimming and fishing and all sorts of things. And there's been a long history of um, limnology stations where uh, on, so um, field stations on lakes that would um, go and measure the temperatures uh, regularly because there were people permanently based there. And so there's a long history of data, especially in Europe um, for these kinds, of, um, these kinds of data. And now that we've got these long records, we want to know, um, can we detect changes in the lakes um, that might be related to climate change? So on the plot here, and these are data that come from Yestin Woolway and colleagues. And Yestin is a former PhD student of mine and is now doing really good things um, in uh, sort of modeling uh, lake structure, temperatures and things like that around uh, in, uh, in Europe. Um, and this is uh, um, a site in the UK, in the UK Lake District. <clears throat> so about halfway up the country before you get to Scotland. Um, and it's a thing called Blell and Tarn. And, this has been studied for a very long time by the Freshwater Biological Association and now the um, UK government's um, Centres for Ecology and Hydrology. And um, what we're seeing here is a record of, um, of, I think, daily maybe, or maybe monthly temperatures. I forget exactly what um, the resolution is for this particular site. But we're seeing this sort of very um, marked seasonal variation in um, in the temperature of the water. I mean, that's fine. We just, it warms up slowly in the, in, in the summer and then it cools down over the winter. Um, but looking at this, there does seem to be some change in these minimum temperatures, how cool the, the lake gets in the, in the winter. We don't really see that, apart from perhaps this early period here after 1960, we don't really see much change in the maximum values. These peaks are all at the same value, uh, the roughly similar level. But in the minima, we are seeing changes um, potentially. And so we might be interested in saying, well, how do these annual minimum temperatures, how do they, do they change over time? Why, why do we have to worry about this? Well, um, at this annual minimum temperature is a very strong control on many lake ecosystem processes. Um, we know that extreme events where, we, for example, where we've had very mild winters um, in Europe, so that the very warm period in Europe in 2006-07 had a very strong and long lasting effect on the lake ecology of, of some lakes that were studied in, in Europe. Um, so we know that very mild winters, extreme warm winters can have long lasting effects. And there are many um, species um, that are of um, ecological importance um, and from conservation importance that are cold adapted species. They, um, if the lakes become warmer, then there are fewer lakes around for these cold adapted species um, or refugia because these species can't necessarily move around now because they've become sort of stuck on the, on the landscape. Um, and there's two of these examples of the Arctic char and, and the possum shrimp and, and 
there are lots of other examples of these cold um, adaptive species that are becoming threatened now because of, um, potentially threatened because of climate change. So we didn't just have data from Blellum Tarn, this paper that um, Yestin Wilway and colleagues put together, they pulled um, some of the really long records from uh, European freshwaters going back to the sort of 1960s or even earlier in some, in some lakes. And so we've got quite a few lakes in, from UK, uh, from the UK, we've got Blellum Tarn and Estuate water and Windermere's a big lake in the Lake District that's split into the North and the South Basin. Um, I think uh, Thea is in, um, is in Ireland, Loch Leven's in Scotland, and then we've got Batten, um, which is in Sweden, and then I'm not exactly sure where Werva Sea is, but Zurich Sea is in, um, in Austria. Yeah. So we've got some lakes all over, we've got all showing similar patterns, but we want to know how are these minimum temperatures changing over time. So you can't just, and limnologists have a, have a real, um, they really like just fitting linear models. It's the sort of thing I showed you very, at the very beginning. They really like fitting linear models to these kinds of data. And so that's actually what was done in the, uh, in the paper that I mentioned when I talked about blow on time. But we, we shouldn't really be doing that. Um, extreme values, these extreme minimum temperatures, um, don't really follow uh, or meet the assumptions of a linear regression. So the central limit theorem um, applies to a large number of statistical methods. It, um, <clears throat> it it's the theory that underlies a lot of the, the math and the theory that allows us to turn our coefficients into p-values and things like that. Um, but it doesn't apply to things like block minima or block maxima, these extreme events. So these are the annual minimum temperature. And so this is the, the sort of um, lowest temperature that was recorded out of all of the observations in each year. And I'm now just, this is the data that we're actually going to look at. And there does seem to be, now that we've just changed the data to be looking at these annual values, there does seem to be some trend in these. Some lakes show more of a trend than others. So we're going to want our model to adapt to, to the patterns in each of these individual lakes. Okay? But all of these lakes are sort of from roughly the same part of the world. So they should all look roughly similar to them, to, to one another. So I, I mentioned these things called block minima. So these are block minima in the statistical sense parlance. Um, they are the minimum value of a block of 12 months worth of observations. So they're block minima. They don't really follow um, the sort of uh, central lim limit theorem doesn't apply to these kinds of data in the same way. But thankfully we do have some theory to work on. So there's this um, theorem that says that the maximum of a sample of IID random variables after some renormalization can only converge in distribution, so it's a limit theory, to one of three possible distributions. One of them's the Gumbel distribution, one of them's the Frechet distribution, and then the other one is the Weibel distribution. And this theorem is known after the people who sort of independently came up with it and worked on, on it. Um, and I'm showing these are the, the three gentlemen that um, came up with this particular theory. Now I mentioned block minima and the theory just refers to block maxima. But we need to do something to fix this. You know, does our theory apply to minima values in the same way that it applies to maxima? Well, we can just apply a very highly technical fix to our data. We just negate the minima, turn them into maxima, and now we can fit our model. And as long as we take account of the fact that we did this, um, this highly technical uh, data manipulation, um, then we can, as long as we account for that afterwards, then our model is fine for fitting minima, even though we're gonna use them as maxima. We just have to remember that now we're looking for a decrease in the maxima, which would have been then means an increase in the minimum temperatures. Okay. So now we have these three distributions. How do we choose between those three distributions? Which one do we use? Because they all actually have different properties and it depends on, um, on whether the, the um, events become less and less, how, how the events that at really um, long return periods, it's just what happens in the tails essentially, is what, um, how these different distributions differ from one another. Yeah. Well, thankfully we don't actually have to fit um, all, all three distributions and then choose between them. We can fit a model using something called with a generalized extreme value distribution. And this is the generalized extreme value distribution. It's actually um, 
a, a distribution that has three parameters. So it has a location parameter, uh, mu, just like the, the mean in a Gaussian. It has a scale parameter sigma, just like the standard deviation in the Gaussian distribution. But it also has a shape parameter, this squiggle here, or, or Z, I think it's called. Um, and so you can, by plugging in different values for the shape parameter, you actually get back the different distributions. So when Z uh, is zero, we get the Gumbel distribution. When it's greater than zero, we get the Freshet and then of Frechet. And then uh, when it's less than zero, we get the Weibull distribution. And so now we, can, we have this one distribution that we can use to fit um, to the data. And then we can sort of understand what kind of distribution it might be by looking at the estimated values of the shape parameter. <clears throat> so what we want to do is we want to have a GAM that's going to fit um, these data and we're going to do them all at once in a single model. Um, we want to have a similar sorts of patterns. We want to have the similar sorts of smooth trends in each of our lakes. Um, but we can clearly see that there are some nonlinear patterns. I mean, if we look at Batten, for example, nothing much seems to have happened in this particular lake, but then it starts to increase um, after about 1990-2000. Uh, right? <laughs> so we're going to need things that are nonlinear to tackle these. <clears throat> okay. So what I'm going to do is show how we can fit what we call a hierarchical GAM. So it's hierarchical in the sense that we have um, not just one subject, we have many subjects, many lakes that we want to fit. And we're going to use this generalized extreme value distribution for the response. So that's what the HGAM, HGAMs are these hierarchical models. And the LSS just refers to location scale shape. These things might be better called distributional GAMs. Um, they're often called um, just gamma LSS, depending on um, the terminology or vector gams. All they mean is we're just going to have a model for each of these parameters. Normally when we're fitting a linear regression or a GLM, we're just fitting the mean parameter mu, and we then estimate sigma from what's left over in the data. Okay? But we, it just treat it as a constant. Each observation has the same value. Every observation might have a different mean, because that's our model, that's our line or our spline. Everything had the same uh, value as sigma. But uh, with these location scale models, we can actually have linear predictors or formulas for each of these parameters. So now I can say that the mean, um, the variance, and the shape parameter are all going to vary um, with smooths of year. So they're all going to have a smooth function of year in them. And and I'll show you how we actually fit it, and it sounds a lot more complicated than it, than it really is, but this is the kind of output that we get. These are the estimated smooths for the mean function. So there are, um, we have what, nine, nine lakes, so there are nine um, smooth functions here. This is the estimated um, sort of variance parameter or standard deviation, the sort of um, scale parameter. Um, this one has much less variation except for one of our lakes. <coughs> And then this is the, um, the value for the shape parameter, which controls sort of which of those distributions there is. Um, really, we're just interested in, I'm mainly interested in, in this one at the moment to sort of model the trend in them. But you could actually use these um, other parameters to say things about how likely it is that we would get a particular temperature um, of, a, of a, a, any particular temperature now and to sort of see whether it's become more or less likely and things like that. So these. Taken together, each of these, all three of these parameters define the full distribution. This notation that I'm showing up here is just saying, okay, I've got, um, this is my, my year, it's just centered here. So I've just um, set the zero value to be in the middle of the time series. Um, and then I'm just saying, I want one of those for every lake. <clears throat> um, and I'll show some of the fitted values and things in a minute. So this is, this is how we use MGCV. So it's a little bit more complicated than the example that I showed earlier. Rather than having um, one formula, because I've got three parameters I want to estimate, I have to provide a list of formulas. So the first formula here, this is the standard one. This is for the fitting the mean. And that's the only one that contains the, the response, which is our negated minima. Okay. Um, we have a formula here, then this is for the... For the um, scale parameter, and then this is a formula for the shape parameter. <clears throat> and in each case, I've just got the same smooth function. So this is a smooth function of that centered year variable. And then I'm also doing what's known as a factor smooth interaction here, because I don't want just one smooth for all lakes. I want to have a different smooth for each lake, um, but I want them all to be sort of roughly the same. 
And what this is doing is creating essentially a random, uh, not a ransom, a random slope and intercept kind of model, like a mixed effects kind of model, but it's doing it for a spline. So instead of getting a random linear function out for each lake, what we're getting here is a random smooth for each lake. <clears throat> and we're getting that for, this is the trend in the mean, this is the trend in the scale parameter, and this is the trend in the shape parameter. <clears throat> we have to tell it what family we want, and then um, there comes a series of link functions um, for these because we can have a link function uh, for every parameter. And the link functions just map um, the, the, um, the values from the, these linear predictors onto the right scale. And so because the, there's some restriction on the shape parameter, it's why it needs this log it scale parameter. Okay. But apart from having an extra formula and, and a few extra control things in here, this model can be fitted in exactly the same way, and it only takes a few seconds actually with GAM, uh, MGCV to, to fit this. <clears throat> so this is what the observe versus fitted values look like. And um, for each of our sites, we do a pretty good job. I mean, obviously we're not capturing a lot of the sort of year-to-year -year variation that goes between these sites, and a, and a more, um, um, a more rigorous analysis would actually account for some of that. There might be some sort of temporal autocorrelation or um, have you in here, um, but we're doing a pretty good job. And actually, if you look at the residuals and all the rest of it, there doesn't seem to be any autocorrelation left in these residuals. We do seem to be a pretty good job of, of, of fitting these values, even though there is still quite a bit of scatter between them. And so now these are, if you then undo that highly technical fix, this is what the estimated trends are doing in each of these, uh, in these lakes. And so we see the sort of strongest changes perhaps in Vatten and Wervesey. Um, these lakes are um, perhaps a bit more sensitive because they were sort of um, very much ice um, covered lakes uh, for a large part of the year. And, um, and now they're starting to sort of see melting um, happening or not as many years where we are seeing um, strong ice cover. <clears throat> and that's why this the sort of water temperature couldn't get any lower here because it was frozen. Okay? But now we're sort of seeing these lakes where this lake is not freezing up now um, <clears throat> as often <clears throat> or as deep. So we have a model. One model gets us our nine fitted values. It does a pretty good job of fitting all of these things. Okay. And um, if we summarize this, if we actually start to take these models apart and look at them, then these minimum temperatures have increased in the last 60 years, they've increased on the order between one and three degrees. Um, and we can, can show, and I'm not showing it here for interest of time, but um, we can show that the distributions of these minima have also changed over time. Because we modeled all of the parameters, we can actually um, look at the shapes of all those distributions. Um, and this kind of has implications for future events. It means it's really unlikely that we would see temperatures as cold as we were seeing in the 1960s now in any of these lakes. And that really means that these refugia or the habitats for some of these um, <coughs> uh, threatened species are now very much at risk because of, I guess, climate warming. <clears throat> and so this is a pretty good way of modeling these data. It was actually very simple. We didn't have to learn very much more, except knowing that we needed this particular family um, and we can fit this using the same sort of tools that we would have fitted to the temperature data, except we've just changed a few little bits. <clears throat> <clears throat> so I wanted to just show that we don't have to be restricted to just fitting these things in MGCV. MGCV is a really great tool. Simon Wood and his um, students and postdocs over the years have done a really good job of, um, of making a, um, a, a piece of software that, um, that works really well. It runs incredibly quickly. Um, but it is not perfect for everything. Um, and I wanted to talk about BRMS as another tool that we could use where we can reuse some of the things that we've learned from MGCV, but apply them now in a sort of fully Bayesian way and take advantage of um, fitting using STAM. Um, <clears throat> so MGCV fits uh, what's known as an empirical Bayesian models. When, we, when we're fitting with REML or ML smoothness, the models that MGCV fits when we, we have those particular smoothness things are empirical Bayesian models. There's a, a um, the, the theory just coincides that a Bayesian view of smoothing just happens to be what you're doing when you're fitting MGCV models with REML or ML smoothness. They're empirical Bayes because we don't have the full posterior distribution. We have to make some assumptions about that. But the, we do get these point estimates, which would be the posterior, um, posterior means. Uh, from a fully Bayesian one. We don't get the full posterior though. Um, and 
um, the, part of the reason for this is that it's an empirical Bayes method also is that we have improper Gaussian priors. So, um, and I should say, we can't penalize the linear bits of the basis. <clears throat> so they're improper priors. It's an improper kind of Bayesian analysis. So they don't have proper priors on these things, but it is a Bayesian analysis. If we wanted to do fully Bayesian modeling, then we can use BRMS. We can actually use JAGS and other things as well to do this. But I think BRMS is sort of the easiest interface for learning. And also it uses STAN, which is sort of a very popular um, way of fitting Bayesian models at the moment. And we also don't have to learn anything new uh, or we have to learn very little new because we can specify our models using smooth functions that MGCB provides. The only difference is that we can't use um, tensor products these, that are created by the TE or the TI function. We can just use tensor products that are created using the T2 function. And this is just because of the way BRMS, and it's the same with the GAM4 package, um, it's the, that uses the um, LME4 package to do the actual fitting. It's just because of how the GAM model has to get represented as a random effects, mixed effects model, right? But apart from that difference, we can pretty much do everything that we can do in MGCB, we can do in BRMS. <clears throat> so um, this is actually just for research that has been going on that I've been doing with one of my colleagues and my colleagues at the University of Regina. Um, on microcystin, and this paper actually got published just um, uh, on Friday. Um, it, microcystin is a liver toxin that's produced by cyanobacteria, these blue-green algae that we might find in our lakes and, um, and ponds, especially during the summer months where there's lots of, and there's lots of nutrients and, lots of, and the temperatures are high. Um, these things can um, bloom, and then the cyanobacteria create these toxins. Microcystin is one of those toxins. And they frequently cause um, problems for humans and for pets. Um, they're often the reason why there are lots of um, no swimming signs up on, on lakes uh, in the summer because uh, these things have been detected. Um, they probably won't kill um, humans, but if there's a very you know, strong bloom with lots of toxins being produced, they can certainly kill pets and they can certainly make you feel very, very sick um, as a, yourself. And so these cyanobacteria, they bloom under the right conditions. They cause things called HABs, harmful algal blooms. And we've been seeing increases in these HABs all around the world because a lot of our lakes have been uh, polluted through nutrients. So things that are stuff that we eat that goes down um, the sewage pipe, uh, things that come off uh, farmers' fields and so on, where our wastewater treatment plants are not very good and haven't been removing some of these nutrients or where um, agriculture has led to too many nutrients being uh, fertilizers applied to the, um, to the, to the field, or um, there's too much animal waste, and it then runs off um, and is not captured, it runs off into our rivers and streams. And so nutrients are sort of the driving this, but also climate change. And uh, my colleague at the University of Regina, Peter Levitt, um, he's been doing um, sort of long-term ecological research and monitoring lakes in the Capel Valley for um, 27 odd years now, um, but for 11 of those years, um, every two weeks when there's no ice on the lakes, which is only for about six months of the, of the year in Saskatchewan, because it's pretty cold in the winter, um, for 11 of those years, they've been, we've been collecting microcystin concentrations. So they've been actually taking the water and measuring how much of this toxin is in each of them. And if you're interested in the things I'm about to show you, this paper just came out um, on Friday, um, where you can go and find out more about this sort of stuff. So the problem with uh, microcystin is we have these non-detects. Um, the microcystin, our method is for, for um, measuring the toxin is not particularly sensitive to very low concentrations. And so when there's only a few of these algae in the water, they, um, they produce small amounts of toxin and we maybe can't detect that. So we get a lot of um, observations that are non-detects or below um, our level of detection. So those data are censored. We know that they have a concentration that is between zero and our level of detection, but we don't know what um, the, the true value is. And so ideally, we'd like to take account of that. And we can't fit these models in MGCV because MGCV doesn't have any way, any censored distributions. Um, MGCV doesn't have any functionality for doing this. Um, but I wanted to show, this is what um, we, we would have for our, um, for these data, we've got several lakes. We've got uh, quite a few lakes. We've got six lakes that we're gonna do this modeling for. I want to know how the microcystin concentration is varying through the year and over time because we're collecting every two weeks. So there's 
um, some increase over time in the microcystin concentration and then a decrease at the end of the year. But that, how are these things changing over time? So this is a tensor product that gives us an interaction between these two things. And then I want to do this separately for each lake because each lake is going to be um, showing different trends over time because they're quite different lakes in, in some respects or some of these lakes are anyway. Okay. Um, so this would be if we had no sense of data, we could do this. We just fit them because then this is a concentration. So it's a continuous value, has to be greater than zero. And we would use a gamma distribution with a log length. But the rest of this is sort of pretty similar to the things I've been showing before. Okay. Now if we do that, we'd actually get a biased model and we get an inconsistent model um, because we're not taking into account the values that we might treat. So we might set all the sense of values to have some half the detection limit or we might just exclude those data. Um, that would give us a bias model. And so using BRMS, we can fit essentially the same model um, because it uses MGCV smooths, but I can also take account of the censoring. So this is the BRMS version of this model. Um, notice I said we had to use T2 to get tensor products. So we're getting a smooth, this is the kind of, this is the smooth version of an interaction between the day of year and the, the the time variable, the trend in our lakes. Okay? Um, but we set this up using T2 instead, but otherwise these two models are the same thing. Um, and then on the left hand side here, we just tell it um, which of our observations are censored or not. Right? And then it fits a censored, in this case, a censored gamma model. And then there are some extra things because this is doing um, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, we have to tell it how many observations we want in the warm up and how many samples to do, how many chains, and so on. But they're just sort of like the extra details, just like telling it that we wanted to use method REML or what these control parameters here from MGCV. So the nice thing is, is that you, once you, if you know how to fit models in MGCV, um, it doesn't take that much to translate that model into a fully Bayesian model that you fit using BRMS. It takes a heck of a lot longer to fit this model than it would in MGCV, but also this is the correct model and this is, uh, is not the correct model. Um, so doing the sampling takes a long time, but it's worth it, especially in this case. So here I'm showing for the, our six lakes that we had these concentrations for, I'm just showing the, um, how well our model sort of does relatively. Um, it fits the data pretty well. Uh, the red dots on here, these are all the censored values. So one of the advantages of our model is um, we, the, the censored observations, we actually get a fitted value. So we have to, we have to set them to something when we, um, um, put the, the data into BRMS. It doesn't actually use this number. We just set them to our detection limit. Um, okay, but um, we actually get a fitted value for each of these um, ones. So we can actually sort of now do something with these. We actually get a model prediction for these observations that we didn't know what the microcystin concentration was. So they're in red. And then the gray ones are all the, the, the detected microcystin concentrations. And for most of these, we do a pretty good job. There's roughly the sort of same scatter above and below. Sometimes we are actually on a, on a little bit on the low end. We tend to under predict the microcystin concentration. But all in all, uh, given that they're quite complicated data, we do a reasonable job of, of fitting these things with our GAMs. So this is what the fitted within year. So this I'm showing here now the fits over day of year. This is the posterior mean of our distribution. And over time, so this is sort of how things change within a year. And we can see that these lighter colors represent later years. So there does seem to have been some shift in both the shape of these curves. So we're seeing high concentrations of microcystin earlier in the years. Um, and not all sites are doing that. Wiscana um, had its highest concentrations um, earlier in the record for some reason. And this is the lake that's in the center of Regina. Uh, it does some other things. But there is a general tendency in most of the other sites to sort of move. So we're getting um, higher and more de and, uh, detectable concentrations of microcystin earlier in the year. And I'll just do a quick zoom in so you can sort of see some of these things a bit more. So we're sort of seeing higher concentrations, but also we're seeing these uh, peak concentrations happening earlier in the year. So we can turn that information, because we get the full model posterior, we can sort of say, okay, I can predict what our model says for every day of year, for each of the years in our time series. And I can say, how often out of all those posterior simulations was, did the model say that we were exceeding some drinking water qualities? So this is our detection level for the microcystin, but then there are some other drinking water, water quality and recreational, um, uh, thresholds for concentrations of microcystin. And what we're showing here then is the probability for every day of the year 
for each different year. And we can see, and it's just turned these numbers essentially into um, probabilities of exceeding these different thresholds. And so if we just zoom in a little bit, we see that we do see a much earlier, we have a much higher risk earlier in the season of detecting microcystin now. Um, and microcystin concentrations are very high for much longer in the, in the year, suggesting that you have a much higher chance of being exposed to this particular toxin um, for much longer periods in the year. And this has implications if you, know, if you have, um, have a cottage on a lake, and you, um, which many people do in the prairies, and you want to go swimming, or you have pets who you like going in the water, this potentially means that you can't actually use the lake for as many um, days of the year. So you're, there's reduced recreational efforts. Some of these lakes, like Buffalo Pound, is actually used as the water source for Regina, um, the city here. Um, now, they don't take the, the water from where um, the algae are living. They take it from deeper down. But it does. there are implications for um, people who are using um, other surface waters where there are algal, algal concentrations. They're, those systems will also be showing patterns like this. They might be being exposed to toxins in their drinking water because of these changes in um, essentially climate and nutrients over the last um, few uh, last decade. And now because it's a Bayesian model, we want to see how well do we re recreate our data. We have to do some posterior predictive checks. These things can all be easily done from the posterior. And I'm showing several different ones here, but we actually looked, we didn't do, I said we didn't do a very good job. We sort of under predicted um, at times, but we also didn't do a very good job of picking up the proportion of non-detects in our model. So our model, actually the low end was slightly over predicting. So our models are slightly conservative in terms of the risk. Um, that you might have. And, um, but we can do that for all sorts of different concentrations. And as soon as, as we start to get a little bit of a higher concentration, the purple histograms here, this is from every one of our posterior draws, they start to coincide with the observed values, which suggests that our generative model is able to recreate most of the data. It just can't um, recreate quite so well the number of, of non-detects in here. We actually over predict those. We actually have um, we're predicting lower than we should be in terms of the microcystin concentration. Here we're predicting too many um, censored values. But apart from that, our model does a pretty good job. Okay. If you're interested in how these um, models work uh, in more detail and actually want to dig into some of the code, then these two papers, this is a paper that I wrote um, a couple of years ago, um, which does the sort of things that I've been talking about today, but in lake sediment records, which are a bit more complicated. To, to fit things in. But that's got a ton of code in the supplementary methods. And then this paper with Eric uh, Peterson, who is now at Concordia, Dave Miller, who works in, at St. Andrews in the UK, and, uh, and Noam Ross, who I'm supposed to be competing against um, today. Um, we wrote this paper um, showing about how, how we do these hierarchical models, where we fit more than one site. And um, this is a really good, great collaboration. We, uh, all four of us have taught um, workshops together and it was really good fun writing this paper, even though I think uh, when we started it, we hadn't even met uh, in person uh, before. Um, but the, you can go and have a look at those papers. They're full of our code if you want to know how we fitted these models uh, to those. And I'd just like to close then with some acknowledgements, funding to sort of keep my students and me um, in money to do this work. And also the people who provided the data. And although I am, uh, um, I have got my slides, they will be up on my website here. Unfortunately, I um, uh, made a bit of a Git error just before I came onto the Zoom meeting, and so they aren't there, but I will make sure that they are there um, later today after I've figured out what my Git error is. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk. I saw some people saying how much it already. Uh, so thank you very much. And if you were in person, we would give you a round of applause. Uh, I, I, I was uh, speaking at Eram that last week and they had virtual applause machines. I'll have to work on getting that here uh, for next time. But uh, thank you very much for, for the wonderful talk. Uh, my knowledge of GAMS has improved as I hope they would. <laughs> so we have a few questions for you. Uh, let me dig in here. Let's see, is that a recent one? All right. So I'm going to try and go in order that I've seen them. So bear with me as we go through them. Uh, 
Someone asked a question early in the beginning, is S predefined? How would you derive how would you derive S from so that's sort of cut off, but how would you derive S and what how is it defined? Um, so I guess they're talking about the, the function in the um, in the models. And yeah. I, I'll just go and share my my screen again. Oop. Where am I? Might be easier. Um, yeah, S is S is a function, and it can actually create um, lots of different um, lots of different splines. The default is um, yeah. Where am I going to go? The the default is is to produce something called a fin plate spline. Um, and I don't want to get into too much of the detail. I'm going to go back over here. I don't want to get into too much of the detail about it, but it is very similar to a cubic spline. It just has some um, extra properties that make it optimal. Um, one of the reasons that the, the, e, the S that, that we have here is um, it uses these fin plate splines is um, you have a knot selection problem. So I mentioned these knots that, we, um, that you have when and you put a basis function at each knot. And so you have this problem if you use cubic splines, you have to tell it how many knots you want and where you want those knots. And fin plate splines allow you to get a, around that because they, the, you have a basis function at every knot and, and then Simon Wood came up with this idea of that you could take most of the information from this really rich basis and get rid of most of it and still keep most of that information by using basically a, essentially like a principal components analysis on the basis, so it's an eigen decomposition. And so what you get by this S by, for default is not a cubic spline, it's a fin plate spline, but you can change the different splines and there are lots of splines that are available in, um, in MGCB that they include the cubic splines and P splines and B splines, but also more complicated things like random effects and Markov random fields and Gaussian processes and things. And if you want to know how they actually get created, um, then uh, maybe talk to me afterwards or you can have a look at Simon's book where he explains a lot of this. Um, but they're built in the same way I essentially I showed you for the, um, the cubic splines. It's just they're using a slightly different equation um, than the B spline one. Uh, then the sorry the cubic spline one. Yeah. Great. I'll say that I just picked up uh, picked up Simon's book. Uh, I'll be reading that soon. And that my first introduction this is me going off on a tangent here to splines was from the Hasty Tripciani book, their green book yep. about smooths in general. And there's I think two chapters on GAMS roughly, or maybe one chapter. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, one of the things to be very careful of with. Um, with that is that a lot of people think about GAMS in terms of the, what was in Hastin and Tipshirani's um, book, and they mm -hmm. have a package called GAM, mm -hmm. and that gets very confusing. And I see a lot of people get um, confused trying to use tools from the GAM package in MGCV and they're not working, but also vice versa. And so if you are trying some of the site, don't load the GAM package and the MGCV package at the same time. They can get cause problems. Yeah. Great to know. I find that a lot with a uh, hasty chip Shani. Like for instance, they have the GBM package, which has often arguably been exceeded by XG boost. Uh, and they have the GAM package being exceeded by MGCV. They, uh, they pioneer the field and someone mm -hmm. comes in and improves on it. Very, very much so. Yeah. And yeah. Um, they're, they're off doing other things. And then it was just other people picked up these ideas of doing the actual smoothness selection. And that's what yep. we get with MGCV. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know a little bit of that history. Thank you. Uh, we have another question, which probably not necessarily up your alley, and actually Rami already answered it. Rami spoke last month. Uh, someone asked about packages in Python. Way to go, Alan, for uh, to do GAMs. Uh, so no, Rami already answered about PyGAM and mm -hmm. H2O. Do you have anything to add to that? No, PyGAM is the one that um, I'm sort of at, at least familiar with because I see people asking questions about that on cross-validated and things. Um, I, haven't, okay. I, don't, I don't know Py, Python at all, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. Cool. Well, we'll thank Rami for that. Um, another question is, what do the beta coefficients and the points at which one changes from one spline to another tell us about the physical properties of the system? Um, so I don't think the basis functions tell us anything about the, the, the system at all. I mean, they're, we, essentially they're, um, they're not arbitrary, but we, um, we just... Um, and one thing I didn't cover in here is I just said, oh, we have some basis functions and by default they're, they're 10. They're not quite 10 actually, but let's just go with 10. Um, there's 10 of these basis functions by default, but that, that doesn't mean that every system has to have 10 basis functions. 
uh, when we're fitting, usually what we say is you need to have as many basis functions as cover the sort of the, the complexity that you expect. So if your data are wiggling all over the place, then you need more basis functions to fit. So you should choose that up front and the, the defaults are, are, are essentially arbitrary. Um, but they don't really tell us anything that we can't interpret those basis functions uh, mechanistically. Um, so there might be some models like um, um, FAMO um, phonological models where you fit a particular function and the parameters mean something. Um, with the, most of the models that we have here, the parameters are not interpretable um, in that kind of way. Um, so they don't mean anything. Are there interpretable, interpretable coefficients? You get coefficients, yeah. I mean, essentially, if we didn't have that penalty in the model, um, doing the penalized um, version of the model, um, when essentially a gamma is just a GLM, it's just now you've got many more columns in your model matrix, one per basis function, mm -hmm. rather than a single value of X. So yeah, the gamma is, it, for a lot of cases, is just a GLM with a, a, an enriched model matrix. So they would mean as much as they would mean for a linear model or a GLM. Um, it's just that the, you can't even really interpret them in necessarily in terms of the underlying functions of the splines because they've um, often been subjected to this eigen decomposition to make them sort of lower dimensional. So they don't have an ease, they're, they're not in, easily interpretable is the, the main thing. And that's not why we're doing it. We're more interested when we're fitting these models to estimate some change or estimate some smooth relationship. Um, so we're interested in the bigger picture rather than what the individual functions tell us. And speaking of the basis functions, could you get similar results from using the, uh, the basis spline function? I forget what it's called. I think it's NS to create the new columns and fitting a GLM on that. Would that get you a similar answer? Yeah, it would. So if you were doing that, then if you use NS or BS, um, the, they would get very similar things. The only difference between there is that those things are just fitting a regression spline. There's no penalty. So if mm. you tell BS that you want 10 basis functions, if you set the degrees of freedom to be 10 or something, then um, that's what you get. And there's no, there's no shrinkage. There's none of this smoothness selection. Um, if you used GlimNet as your regression model, would that get you closer then? GlimNet, oh, okay, so that would be, yeah. Um, that would get you closer because you're then shrinking the parameters. Um, right. But the, the, you're shrinking those parameters in terms of the fit rather right. than shrinking them in terms of the curvature. So that it's a different penalty. Mm -hmm. The penalty is on the, I guess, the absolute size of those coefficients as opposed to the wiggliness of those coefficients. But that, actually, idea, that idea of GlimNet has been picked up and these lasso penalties has mm -hmm. been picked up on a very similar technique called um, trend filtering, which um, the, one of the Tibshirani's, I think it's actually Rob Tibshirani's son, Ryan, has right. um, been working on recently. And trend filtering is, uh, is a, a really interesting way of working uh, with splines, has different properties, different penalties. But um, that's what's such essentially applying the lasso in a, in a similar kind of way to fit these splines on the coefficients, not on the curvature itself. Well, it's interesting. Your curvature penalty looks like beta at beta s beta, and the ridge the ridge penalty is essentially beta time, beta beta, right? Yeah. So these are ridge penalties on the essentially. I think they're ridge penalties. As well, no, that's not true. Some of the splines have ridge penalties on them, um, but yeah. <clears throat> Um, and someone actually asked about that, the, um, the S in the beta transpose S beta, is that related to the S function or is that uh, another matrix in there? No, it's just, that's just the terminology of um, Simon Wood, but S, S is the penalty matrix. That's where, that's the bit that encodes the, um, the information about the wig, uh, to some extent about the wiggliness of the curve. Mm -hmm. um, so S, wiggliness of the basis functions, that's Got what it. It, it can encodes. And it just means we, we make that transformation so that we, when we're doing our model, uh, estimating our model, the penalty is written in terms of the coefficients. It's not written in terms of something else that we have to calculate. It just makes it right. simpler uh, to fit. Yeah. And speaking of uh, the I guess, explanation of it, someone asked, what kind of language do you use to explain GAMS in scientific publications? <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it depends who I'm, who we're writing for. Um, so I, I, Trent, I try to not use too much math. I mean, I'm not a math geek at all. I don't, mm -hmm. um, I don't always, I don't fully understand all of the math behind these games. Um, I just try and explain them in terms of what the the smooths actually represent. So I might 
talk about rather than like a the smooth of, of year or the smooth of day of year i might be talking about how things change with the seasonally or what the the long-term trend is and that's how i try and explain these things and i'm more interested in so we don't we're not actually worrying too much about the the individual basis functions it's more just looking at the the splines that we get out and then interpreting what they mean so just telling us where things have changed or what have you in terms of the trends okay so it's more about in, you're not trying to interpret individual variables necessarily. Oh, you but can. You do. Are. Yeah, 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 you can. You can do it. Um, you, but you don't. You often um, do it visually. And so this is where I get back to the sort of interpretation of the model. It, mm -hmm. You actually do the a lot of the interpretation visually in terms of the effects. So mm -hmm. um, that's why I showed a lot of plots and just sort of we could see well what was happening. The splines were sort of uh, the microsystem were moving earlier in the year. We can do things like compute the derivatives. So how um, how fast the, the slope is changing, and that would allow us to detect if there are changes. So one of the things we we're doing with the global temperature data is sort of saying, well, where, where can we detect um, a significant change in that global temperature? And I don't know if you remember a few years back, there was this big, um, a lot of the climate um, skeptics were sort of saying, oh, the, the, climate is, the climate change is paused. There was this great pause thing going on. Actually, if you, had, you did fit those data properly using one of these splines, the trend was always going up in there. Hmm. It was just they cherry picked the data and weren't looking at it properly. But we can do things like that and actually look at the derivatives of those curves and, and do stuff like that to get rates of change. Out of them. Speaking of visualization and derivatives, a leading question. Do you know of a good package for visualizing this in, you know, in R? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> there's, a, there's a few now. I mean, lot, uh, quite a few people have come up with packages for um, helping sort of do more things with GAMS. So some of the packages like um, um, EM means, for example, um, that has functionality for working with GAMS. Um, um, one of um, Simon, well, Simon Wood's current postdoc, uh, Matteo Fasciolo, has a, a package called MGC Viz, which is on CRAN, and that's got a whole load of... Um, um, data visualization tools for working with GAMS. And then I have, um, I've been working on a package called Gratia, uh, which is also on CRAN for making it easier to work with, um, making it easier to work with these um, GAM, MGCV fitted models, but um, using sort of tidy tools and returning tibbles and things that you can plot with ggplot and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I as a leading question, because I actually had to have Noam tell me about that package you wrote recently and it was very helpful. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> yep, I gave a talk about model visualization and that was a nice one to have. Um, so thank you for writing it. Sorry for the noise, but yeah, he's very excited. He'll, he's gonna regret this in his life when he sees a video of himself in front of a thousand people. <laughs> uh, he's squirming away. Uh, we had another question here. We have a few questions. Um, you, we, you talked about actually a little bit ago, um, but someone did actually ask a question. The the 10 basis uh, uh, basis functions by default, is that a parameter you would tune over or is that something that the model sort of fits? Yeah, so the, the model actually does that internally. So it's, it's internally doing that optimization. So, it, so I'm, I'll probably get the exact detail of the algorithm wrong, but essentially you, you have a value for the smoothness parameter. And then given that value for the smoothness parameter, you choose some coefficients and then you update your value of the smoothness parameter. And that's all going on internally um, in MGCV. The only, can, the, the, the only problem with that is that um, you can only fit as wiggly a model as the number of basis functions that you have. And so if you choose too few basis functions, you don't have enough then you might um, under smooth drastically. You might end up fitting back a straight line. And so the main thing that um, users have to do is they really have to just choose this one thing. It's called K is the parameter. Uh, it's not even a parameter, it's just a number. Um, and that just tells it how many basis functions you want to, to use. And um, I mean, it seems, sounds easy, but we just tell people, oh, we'll just choose set K large enough that it will contain the sorts of wiggliness that you want. And uh, so, but you, you do get used to this as you start fitting more models. There is a function in MGCV that will tell you or, or guide you if that K was too low and it's called gam.check. And um, you can, if you run that on your model, it will do a sort of permutation test to see if there's any, any other wiggliness left in the model, uh, sorry, in the data, in the residuals. And if there is, that might suggest that you need to put K higher. And, hmm. and that's the only thing that you really need to do as a user beyond choosing which splines you want to use, um, you just need to change K 
Okay. I guess that's the sort of thing you could, um, I know Max is incorporating GAMS into tidy models soon. That could be a, uh, a variable you would just iterate over and do again and again. You could do, although a lot of the, what, what Max is doing in those models is essentially like, um, like the lasso penalty order. You want to tune over that parameter. Right, well, well yeah, yes, sir. That's actually happening in the model. The problem is, is yeah. that it can, it starts off um, with a value or the maximum wiggle is you can have if you've set that too low then you might be missing some of this wiggliness. Oh, it's a maximum wiggliness. Okay. Yeah. That, all right. that, that's what I was hoping it was, but it didn't sound Sorry. like it. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yes, yeah, so it's the maximum wiggliness. Yeah. yeah. Great. That, make, that makes it even better. Don't need to tune over it ourselves. I love it when, I love it when, you don't, when it's all more automatic. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question about uh, how do you think about extrapolating outside the observed range of, outside the observed range of games? I see this is a thing. Yeah. Um, you you can you can do it. Um, I mean, you have to be a bit careful about um, extrapolating with GAMS, and certainly you you can't just use the formulations that I had in in the slides here to do it. Because whilst the um, the extrapolation behavior might be reasonable, it'll just extract linearly in some cases. Um, the uncertainty that you get at, that the model will say the uncertainty on the estimate is is way too low. It doesn't really reflect the true uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're using the um, second derivative penalty, then your curves, these curves can actually just go off all over the place. So they're really mm -hmm. problematic. So you have to do some tuning. And on my blog, um, uh, on my website, I had a post up uh, like a couple of weeks ago, um, just looking at how you control some of the behavior for extrapolating um, sort of briefly. And, and there are ways that you can control it and make it not do such silly things. Um, but I think really that's not the main advantage of, of GAMS. Um, the, because they're really defined for the data, you're learning from the data that you have, and they're not really designed then to sort of do some extrapolation. But you, you can do it, you just have to be very, very careful. So speaking of extrapolating towards the outside, and you did say it's possible, but someone's asking about uh, time predictions of GAMS, and does it, how does it diverge at the end there? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so depending on what kind of penalty you use, what kind of mix of penalties, and I, I would not fit the models that I was doing. If I, if I wanted to predict like from the global temperature models or whatever, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be using those, those particular splines. I'd be using the B spline version that, that comes with MGCV. And mm -hmm. then what, uh, people are still working on this and Dave Miller and Simon Wood are, are actually doing some work on this. Um, they were telling me recently, um, but, what you want to do is you want you to have your penalty working out in that area where you don't have. So the, the, you use the penalty to stop the curve going off and doing re really crazy things. So normally the penalty and the basis would be defined just for your data. But if you can make the penalty extend at, the, at both ends or at just one end if you want into that period where you want to do your prediction from, um, if you make the penalty go in there, then um, it stops the curves doing crazy stuff but it also um, allows the uncertainty bands to more realistically represent the, the real uncertainty that you have. Um, they'll still sort of extrapolate off linearly um, right there. They just won't, they, they won't go crazy, um, but at least the uncertainty bands sort of should un, um, go quite wide, quite quickly, which is what we want. And they don't if you don't put the penalty out there. And is that what a profit is doing? So I'm not 100% sure exactly what Profit is doing. Um, and one of the other things is if you've got um, highly structured data, like I know Profit is working with sort of data that are at a weekly level and you have daily data. And um, so you, you would want to encode a lot of that fluctuations and that variation. You'd want to encode that um, um, using separate smooths, like I did in the microsystem where I had a smooth of day of year. I didn't have just one really complicated smooth that was going up and down for every year over the thing. Um, when you do that, you're not really extrapolating for any of the, I'm not extrapolating for the day of year. What you're doing with profit is then you're extrapolating just the year smooth. And that year smooth is probably a lot simpler and it's probably just going to sort of go off linearly into the future. And so I, I, I don't know profit that well. I had a brief look at the, the paper when it, when it came out, um, but I, I suspect that's what it's doing. That's why it can extrapolate because it's just sort of giving this maybe one ahead prediction or something, but you're, you're just predicting the next year and everything else is not extrapolating because you already have seen all those days of year, all those holidays, all those days of weeks, and you've learned from the data what, what those patterns should look like. 
and then then these things work much better yeah. it looks like to me it's a it's, it's a like a bayesian gam but also mm-hmm. like or, almost a bit like the stl where it decomposes the seasonality and the trend and does all that mm-hmm. to speak to your point yeah mm-hmm. and I, that, that's the main thing there's um Simon Wood in, in his book has an example of like doing extrapolating from the atmospheric CO2, the Keeling curve. And um, it, it goes silly. If you just have a, a, ver- a very wiggly smooth, getting all of the seasonal variation, as well as the trend, it does very silly things when you extrapolate. If you model the seasonal variation with one smooth and then the trend with another smooth, hmm. then it, it does a really good job of extrapolating um, outside of the range of the data. And that's where when you do in GAM, you have like a list of smooths, correct? Um, so the, in, you'd have a list of smooths if you fit in multiple parameters. Um, if you, um, um, in the, in the, like in the microsystem one where I had a tensor product of day of year and year, oh. you, you could have just smooth of day of year and a smooth of year, and then the, that would, there'd be no interaction. But that's a decomposition into seasonal term and then the trend. And if you did that, oh. Um, then the model would uh, be better behaved yeah, when you're extrapolating. It, it seems like this function has so many ways to configure it, ways to make the formula. So someone asked, what is the title of Simon's book? <laughs> um, it's called... I think it's Generalized Additive Models, right? Gen- yeah, there you go. Generalized Additive Models, an introduction with R. Make sure you get the second edition. I am not on retainer. Um, it, it's a really good book. It's um, it's in this the red series from um, from CRC, but it's full of tons of R code as well. It's not yep. just the math, right? And if you you can skip the math bits and do the practical bits, and then go back to the math bits if you're uh, interested in more in how these things work. So it's a really good book. Yeah, really recommended. Just had to check it was second edition because I just got it. So. <laughs> Oh yeah, you'd be missing out on a lot if you had the first edition. Yeah. Ah, good to know. Good to know. I got the recent one. <laughs> um, another, oh, this one's interesting. What is the best way to impose monotonicity in a game? Um, so to do that, um, you have to impose some constraints on the coefficients, and you can't do that in MGCV. Um, I think the part of the reason for that is it doesn't quite fit within the sort of fitting algorithms easily that um, um, Simon has in MGCV. But he had, um, he's had a, a, I think she was a PhD student of his called Natalia uh, Pia, P-Y-A, Pia. And um, she has a package called the SCAM for shape constrained additive Mm. models. And um, that can do all kinds of shape con- uh, constraints on the shape. So you can enforce monotonicity and things like that. It just doesn't, I don't think you can do smoothness selection with Remel and things like that with it though. You're just using GCV smoothness selection. Um, there are some things, Simon has an example in his book of using shape constrained piece blinds. But um, again, you're not choosing the smooth, that you have to guess the smoothness parameter when you do that. You can't get MGCV to do it. But SCAM mm-hmm. will do the smoothness selection for you if you use that. And it works in the same way as MGCV. You just, there are different kinds of splines that have different um, shape constraints on there. Uh, so that's, that's pretty cool. I know to do it. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, we'll do one or two more only because I know we want to get to the virtual bar. If people need to go to bed or whatever it may be. Um, <laughs> let me see what we got here. Ah, oh, this is interesting. Um, in many of these examples, we're looking at one measurement at, at each time point. How did games handle uncertainties when there are multiple measurements at each time point, like with replicate surveys? Yeah, so that's where the hierarchical bit comes in. Um, so um, in the same way that I had multiple, I mean, the, as far as the model was concerned, when I had six lakes, I just had a single response variable. And then we used the random spline to sort of break them up. Um, you could do the same sort of thing with with replicates. It would just sort of, in this sense, if you just had replicates and you didn't do anything else, um, they were all just in the same time point, it would just try and fit the average um, value of those those things. If you're talking about you measured um, the same thing, but in lots of different places, and so then you might want to do like random effect type modeling within MGCV and include random effects, you can certainly do all of that. And the models that I was showing and the, the paper that Eric and Peterson and, and Noam and Dave Miller and I wrote um, sort of tries to explain how you might fit 
those models and the different kinds of models that you can, or the different ways you can fit them in MGCV. So you can handle that. Um, if they're kind of thinking of technical replicates, then the model would just sort of smooth through. You got three replicates for each observation. It would just go through the average of those and average in terms of whatever the, on the link scale it would be. Yeah. Okay. Good, because I know hierarchical models are all the rage right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's see if we have time for one more. So, I mean, you sort of addressed this, but like, how do we know the number of knots in, in the smooth function uh, used in a GAM? Because like in NL, NLME, you can define the number of knots in polynomial degree, but I think you were saying earlier not to define that. Yeah. Um well, if, if you're going to choose the number of knots, you have the problem of then saying, where should those knots be as well? Mm -hmm. um, and so if you, if you want to avoid that entirely, I mean, really, what I was just showing, the number of knots just controls the number of basis functions. And for most cases, it's, um, the, the models are not that sensitive to where you place the knots, right? Um, so that's why the default in MVCV, if you have, if you use that, the, the cubic splines, the default is just to set them up um, evenly spaced across the range of the data. Um, now that, if your data are regularly spaced and you have lots of data in certain regions, you might want to have more knots there than elsewhere. So you might want to control that. Um, but the advantage of the, the default basis in, um, in MGCV in the S function, this, this fin plate spline, is that you don't have to think about where those knots should be. In fact, there is a knot at every data point. And then because that gives you a really rich um, basis, in fact, it's too rich, you, it would slow down the computing massively if we used all of those knot, um, knots and, and basis functions. What Simon does is he truncates it and he just concentrates the signal in that basis into the first few um, eigenvalues. Um, and then that's what we use, right? And so you try to avoid, if, if you don't want to choose the number of knots and where those knots should be, just use the default basis. And the only thing you have to tell it then is how many basis functions. And that's then through for this parameter argument K. And that just sets some upper limit on the wiggliness. And you could be really crazy and set K really high, as many as your data, as many as the number of data points minus one. The penalty will then shrink all of that back and just use what's needed but you'll just be wasting CPU cycles doing it, but you can do that. The penalty will shrink all of that extra wiggliness away if it's not needed. Yes. Yeah, I saw um, when, when Noam gave the talk that, you know, the linear model is essentially a special case of this and if it's not needed, that's what will be selected. So why not put in a smooth? Yeah, yeah. And the, I mean, the, the, only, the only slight caveat on that, and you know, we, we do say these things, but um, the, the theory of these models starts to break down a little bit when you get very close to that um, being linear, when it's just slightly nonlinear. And then the models have very, uh, they're very, they can, it's very difficult to choose between something that's linear and something that's slightly curved. And all the theory that we have for correcting the um, uncertainties for having chosen the smoothness parameters and all the rest of that, all of that AIC and everything starts to break down a little bit just as that boundary. Yeah? Um, but in, there are ways to then say, well, let's just fit the linear model. Let's fit a model with a smooth in plus the linear function. And if that, mod, that smooth explains a little bit more, then we can go with the smooth version. Um, or you just accept that you don't really know whether something's exactly linear or slightly curved. Just go with the smooth model. Yeah. And apart from a little bit of extra time in fitting the, the model, it, it, you know, it's, it's not usually that much more you um, guard against choosing, um, assuming that things are linear when they're not. Yeah? And uh, MGCV GAM can do everything that the GLM function can do. So if you're fitting a GLM, there's no real reason perhaps why you wouldn't necessarily want to do smooths. And also MGCV has got a lot more families in it. So you can fit more, a range of models now uh, that you can't do with GLM. But there are lots of advantages to using it. I'm tweeting that. If you're gonna do a GLM, you ju just use GAM instead. I'm tagging you. Okay. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Again, if we were in person, I'd give you a big round of applause. So thank you very much <laughs> thank for you. this it's talk. Been a pleasure. Thank you. Um, 
I would like to just make a few announcements to everyone while they're still here. Uh, first of all, actually, to you, you answered one of my first ever Stack Overflow questions I asked like, like 10 years ago almost. <laughs> so thank you for answering that. Oh, pleasure. <laughs> And people are still commenting on that question. In fact, people will answer me with the solution you gave because I incorporated that into my book and they're answering the answer from my book and citing it, not looking at who asked the question. <laughs> uh, yeah. What comes yep. around? Yeah. <laughs> yep. So thank you. I'd like to thank Eco Health Alliance. They provided this uh, Zoom, Zoom, not Zoom link, the Zoom interface for us. They've been doing that for the past few months. Thank you. It's really, we've got to thank Noam for that. He's the driving force behind getting this from EcoHealth Alliance. So thank you, Noam and EcoHealth Alliance. Um, I'd also like to thank one of our uh, sponsors. And when I talked about my pizza, I showed it off earlier. Scott's Pizza Tours is offering us 25% off their, uh, their virtual tours through the end of July. So if you'd like to take a virtual pizza tour, and I've been watching them there, as I used to be one of the real tour guys, we gave tours in person. So now the virtual ones are pretty cool. If you want to get a 25% off, it's Nerds Love Pizza is the discount code at Scott's Pizza Tours. So thank you to Scott for sponsoring us as well. Let me just make sure if I have any other announcements, I don't want to miss them. I keep a list of these things. Uh, remember next month, we'll be announcing that soon. Remember the R conference coming up um, August 12th through 15th. That includes the workshops. And there is, if you can't find the bar in the gather map, there is a link which Amada is going to post if she hasn't already to the events channel. And you can post it right here in this chat too, please. If people like to go hang out in the virtual bar. I got myself a bottle of Gregnano delivered with that pizza. So I'm going to go enjoy that sparkling red wine, often called the pizza wine. Uh, Gavin, we haven't really met me in person. Um, no, I'm going to tell you, I am more than obsessed with pizza. It might be a little unhealthy. Uh, no, it's very healthy. My cholesterol has gone downhill since I've eaten so much. Uh, and I hope everyone had a wonderful time. I know I did. We will get the slides uh, from Gavin up on NYHackR very soon. Stay tuned for more announcements on the mailing list. And we will be posting this video on our YouTube channel within the next few days. So thank you everyone for attending. I hope to see you in the virtual bar, whether you want to have a glass of water, a soda or a beer or wine, whatever you want to do. And once again, I know we can't applause for real, but thank you very much, Gavin. This has been wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gavin. Yeah, I'll hope to catch some of you in the bar in a minute. So yeah. yes, I'll be right there. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank you. Goodbye everyone.